Coming up on Market to Market. Packing plant closures back up the food supply chain. Close signs hang in more windows as the first checks go out. Experts push an old grid system in a new direction. And market analysis with Sean Hackett next. Once we get to that point, we want to... What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 17 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. With 22 million people out of work and emergency small business loan money exhausted, Congress and the White House are at work on another fix as more data comes in. Retail sales fell a record 8.7%, and without auto sales, it dropped 4.5%. The Creighton University Main Street Index slumped to an all-time low of 12.1. As CARES Act checks go out, predictions of damage to the heartland roll in. A University of Missouri study predicts net farm income will be $20 billion less than 2019. An Iowa State University paper shows $6 billion in losses for Iowa farmers alone. As the livestock sector continues to suffer, farmers remain concerned. Josh Bittner has our report. The shuttering of meatpacking facilities across the country due to cases of COVID-19 diagnosed among hundreds of workers, some fatal, have led to livestock supply chain warnings. Tyson Foods Columbus Junction, Iowa plant and Smithfield Sioux Falls, South Dakota facility, among the higher profile closures in recent weeks, on their own represent 2 and 5 percent respectively of the nation's hog slaughtering capacity. It hasn't been in any farm animals uh, anywhere in the world that we're aware of. Dr. Jim Roth researches infectious diseases and food security at Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. He says international studies have purposely tried to infect pigs to no avail. While Roth zeroes in on bats as coronavirus zoonotic source from Chinese wet markets, people for the ethical treatment of animals protested on the heels of Tyson's Columbus Junction stoppage, citing past deadly disease jumps from swine to people. But Roth says the current threat to the viability of U.S. animal-based food sources is workers. It's very difficult to social distance in any assembly line operation because you have assigned spots where you have to work and next to other people. Even with increased safety measures in place, processors have continued to cease operations for days, weeks, or indefinitely. Roth adds workforce demographics can be another wrinkle. Immigration laws have limited the number of workers available. And then as workers get sick, we're really coming to appreciate how important they are and will continue to be. It's been a struggle to get enough workers, especially in, in the rural areas where some of these packing facilities are located. Mike Poston is president of the Iowa Pork Producers Association. His family operation near Walcott brings 28,000 pigs to market annually. That is one of my concerns, is that, is that this, this workforce is being stigmatized to some degree because of, of this um, issue that we've had with, with positive workers at some of the packing facilities. There's a reason why they're there and why they're working. Posgen sees essential workers like farmhands and meat packers, along with transportation and grocery laborers, on the front lines of the pandemic. He cautions that their perils ripple across the food system. I want to be clear, the bare store shelves that you may see in some cities in the country are a demand issue, not a supply issue. This week, USDA sought to quell concerns over plant closures and milk dumping with plans to seek $16 billion in direct payments for producers and another $2 billion to buy up excess farm products for food banks. We've got it marked out, you know, for the six-foot distance, just to stay in compliance with everything. Um, we are opening up our online bidding for anybody that wants to view online, and you can bid online. 
Corey Rosenboom has adapted his Knoxville, Iowa cattle sale barn to a new reality. A recent study by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association predicted COVID-19 would cause over $8 billion in losses for domestic cow-calf producers in coming years without government assistance. We've never dealt with anything like this before. But Rosenboom's business partner, Joe Wright, claims the industry knows a thing or two about persevering in the face of insurmountable odds. I'd say a cattleman is pretty resilient, you know, for what we've went through in the last 20 years. We're going to get back to something that will be near normal, but this is hit, and it's going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with, I think, from here on out. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Years ago, when the unnamed road outside your place became 270th Street, there was some eye rolling. The first time firefighters unfamiliar with the area made a rescue, the benefits became clear. Use of a decades-old version to pinpoint your location is gaining ground. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more in our cover story. Lydia Mink, who had traveled from the Twin Cities in January 2013 to visit her grandparents in Silver Bay, Minnesota, headed out for some cross-country skiing on a particularly sunny afternoon. She had been skiing for nearly an hour, following the trail maps she occasionally found when she became disoriented and lost. And I remember going against my better judgment or my natural intuition, thinking that I would take a right. And that's where everything went wrong. Her fear increased when she saw prints in the snow she was certain belonged to wolves, which are known to live in the area. And it was getting pretty dark, and it's really quiet, and all the other animals aren't around. You know, am I being followed? And my mind started kind of playing with me. Mink soon reached a wider snowmobile trail where she discovered an unfamiliar blue and white sign. Having a decent cell phone signal again, she was able to talk with Lake County rescuers. Hello. Is this Lydia? This is. Got help on the way there, and they're glad to come out there and get you. So I don't want you to move around too much. Now I'm at, um, it says emergency location. There's two big four-digit numbers. It's 2766 and 3955. That is perfect. And you know what that is? That is a GPS coordinate for my rescue guys coming in. Oh. And you are, of all the signs out in the woods right there, you are at the probably the best one. Okay. So. <laughs> Lake County, along Lake Superior between Duluth and Canada, includes nearly 2,000 square miles of wilderness and 900 miles of trails. In 2011, Shared Geo, a Twin Cities-based nonprofit, worked with the county to create better location markers. The signs they created showed a series of numbers representing a location under a system known as the U.S. National Grid, or USNG. It was one of those blue and white signs, now standardized for national use, Lydia Mink found that day in the forest. We often have people on snowmobile trails, if they get lost or injured, they'll call 911 on their cell phones and the dispatcher will ask them, okay, where are you? And honestly, they say, I'm somewhere between two harbors in Canada. You know, this is about 100 miles. The U.S. National Grid is essentially the same geolocation system the U.S. military has used since World War II. Locations can be conveyed using just the last eight digits instead of the 11 needed with latitude and longitude. Those numbers can be conveyed in three different formats as well. While triangulating cell phone signals can help locate lost callers, problems arise in rural areas with few cell towers. USNGapp.org keeps accurate location information, even without cellular service, by using satellites to establish a location. The accuracy of that location marker could be 5, 10 miles. The app is 30 feet, the size of this room. Stephen Swayze Sr., a retired airline pilot and chair of a Minnesota Emergency Preparedness Committee, is a founder of Shared Geo. 
Swayze and others have spent countless hours over the past decade trying to get federal, state, and local jurisdictions to use the U.S. national grid. Approximately one-third of all response calls in the United States at this time go to a location without a street address. When you have a disaster, who shows up but individuals from outside the community? They don't have working knowledge of that area in a way that they can respond to somebody telling them on a headset, hey, you need to go down to Joe's bar and hang a left. In 2015, FEMA issued a directive saying it would use USNG as its standard geographic reference system. The directive grew in part out of the difficulties related to locating stranded or injured people in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It would be ridiculous to think that the lack of communication about location did not result in people getting uh, injured or killed. Still, many emergency response teams have not yet trained their personnel to use USNG. The U.S. Fire Administration in 2013 did a survey to find out how many entities out there were actually using U.S. National Grid in their response efforts. Two percent was the answer. The Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area is one exception. At the South Metro Station, emergency responders primarily use street addresses, but have had occasional incidents where it paid off to know USNG. It is a, a very simple, intuitive tool. In one case, a man, woman, and young child became lost while boating in the backwaters of the Mississippi River as an evening thunderstorm approached. We checked with the cell phone companies. They were able to get his location to within about, I'll call it 10, an area of 10 square miles. So it didn't do a whole lot for us. I said, can I send you a text message with a web address on it? And uh, go to that web address, take a screenshot of what comes up and send a picture of that screen back to me. So I, within two minutes, I had a picture back from him that really told me where he was within about 10 meters. Despite these successes, the nation has a long way to go before the grid is widely adopted. This is like planting a tree. This is not like flipping a light switch. Ultimately, we need leadership from the top. Otherwise, people continue to be off doing their own thing. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Kranz. Next, the Market to Market Report. The market had little to work with as hopes for renewed Chinese buying evaporated and U.S. farmers dealt with another typical spring weather. For the week, May wheat dropped 23 cents and the nearby corn contract fell a dime. May soybeans declined 31 cents and the meal contract lost 4.30 per ton. May cotton shed $1.60 per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, April Class 3 milk futures weakened another 15 cents. Extremes again in the livestock sector. June cattle rose $1.92. May feeders gained 33 cents. And the June lean hog contract plummeted 10% or $4.95. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index jumped 23 ticks. May crude has plummeted $10 in two weeks with this week's loss of $5.07. COMEX Gold decreased 37.10 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell more than 24 points to finish at 271 even. Joining us now to give us some insight is one of our regular market analysts at Sean Hackett. Sean, welcome back. Glad to have you here via the power of technology. It's great to be here, Paul, and I really appreciate you letting me uh, kind of tap in remotely here. It's uh, really, uh, really nice to spend some time with you here today. Well, I don't want to rub it in. It's not like it's 90 degrees there where you're at this morning or anything <laughs> like that, but uh, the commute home will be a little bit better. But the thing is, Sean, we're going to need you to be commuting. We need people to be out driving. We'll get to that in a moment. I need to start with the wheat market because in the, uh, in the grains, it was one of the poor performers. You've got uh, weather, we had snow in, in a belt south of I-80 to I-70, but there was cold weather over the weekend. There's also Russia, 
There's also Egypt importing. What is the main factor in your eyes when it comes to wheat? Well, the wheat market and the rice market have gone up 10 to 15 percent since the virus took place, while the other grain markets are down 10 to 15 percent. This is primarily from a hoarding stockpiling strategy that occurred because Asia and the Middle East live off of wheat and rice. And so as this panic set in, the demand set in, and all these exporting countries pulled back from wanting to lose these supplies. But now that we're starting, it looks like, to get on the other side of this virus, and we might be opening up the economy, we think that some of that panic buying of wheat is going to relax. This probably was the week we saw the first sign of some of that demand taking a breather and saying, maybe we've done enough for now. Well, and if wheat is always tied to corn, when corn's performing as poorly as it is, it's not helping matters either. So right now in wheat, are you holding for another week, two, before you make a sale? Well, I mean, we have been suggesting that those that are on the producer side of wheat consider making some cash sales. We think that we've had a big rally. Um, we think prices are good. It's one of the few markets you actually, the balance sheet works. You can actually you know, pay your bills with. And so we don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth on this one. We do want to make sure we get this done because the correction could last a little while, especially if we start opening things up here. Sean, I think uh, the, the airlines, the fuel industry folks need you to start flying again. They need you to start driving. Is that really the only thing that's going to save um, corn right now when it comes to chewing through some of this demand? Well, we definitely need to get energy up. We definitely need to get ethanol prices up. You know, there's no way you can lose that kind of uh, demand from the ethanol sector uh, and think that we're going to have a quick turnaround in the corn market. So the answer to your question is, it's not the only ingredient, but it's a key ingredient that we definitely need to see. All right. Well, we have a question that came in here uh, from our audience, and we always like to hear from you via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can always give us a question and uh, reach any of our analysts each week. So this week, Shane in Bloomfield, Iowa, is asking, Corn looks way oversold along with livestock. What are the chances of fund money buying in and running the market higher based on money flow? You just talked about one ingredient. Is this the other? We, as you know, Paul, we specialize in capital flow analysis in grain markets. And we're seeing some of the most positive capital flows right now entering the corn market since late last April. So, you know, we the work that we do says that the odds are improving that we might see the capital flows begin to turn this corn market around after a brutal, brutal period since the beginning of the year. So we actually are getting more constructive the corn market based upon these capital flows that we're seeing. So is 343 the bottom of this barrel? No, no one could say for sure if that's the low. I mean, I wish I could say for sure because a lot depends upon exactly when we open and how things play out with weather and things. But we have to believe that we're getting pretty close. I mean, taking cash bases off, we're almost sub $3 corn in a lot of places, and that's starting to get awfully cheap. And we're a long way from $5, let alone $8. Let's get into, you know, we always have to check in with that prediction. Is $5 realistic in 2020? We think that there's a possibility for that. One of the catalysts that we see, Paul, is that South America is going into their winter season. We know that the virus, the coronavirus, is very sensitive to cooler temperatures. The community spread takes place when the temperatures are cooler. We're very concerned that there may be a rapid escalation of the virus in South America, and there could be some strikes, some issues of workers not going to, uh, you know, to the ports. And so if we see any uh, exports not going out of the country or being delayed, it could create some wild buying into our markets. And that could certainly be something that could catalyze our markets and overcome the barrier of not having ethanol demand right now. Well, you talk about South America. That's a big impact when it comes to the soybean market. Is there going to be some of that carryover, spillover into soybeans with the South American issue that you just discussed? Absolutely. I mean, if they're not going to be able to get corn out, they're not going to be able to sell their soybeans. So it's a grain market issue if they can't get this done. Um, and, and we really think the odds are very strong. I mean, we know the coronavirus is there. We know it's actually in Brazil, the numbers are already getting worse. It's hard for us to imagine that everywhere else in the Northern Hemisphere has had an issue. They're not going to have some disruptions to their supply. Crush numbers were really good last month. They're going to be really bad this month. What is going to, I mean, meal was a, a, a darling there a couple of weeks ago. Is there any darling coming up? 
Well, I mean, I think the components, you know, the, the bean meal and the bean oil actually look pretty constructive to us. Crush is way down. Uh, we, we think demand's going to be fairly stable and fairly good. We have good capital flows that we talked about before, also in bean oil and bean meal. Could be a situation where bean oil and bean meal outperform the soybean market and actually maybe lead the soybean market out of the doldrums. So we're actually constructive of the, the derivative markets right now in the soybean company. So quickly, hold or make a sale now? Are you saying make a sale or hold for a little bit longer on beans? We think it's too late to make sales at this point. Okay, we think all right, we've got to hold for a little bit. Done. All right, Derry, uh, another 15 cents down this week, Sean. That uh, You saw it uh, in your area in the southeast United States dumping um, dairy. Are we going to continue to see that scene play out? Are we going to continue to see a decrease in that contract? It's hard for us to think that we're going to get too much lower, Paul, and we're almost getting down to 2008, 2009 levels. I mean, the industry is completely upside down financially. Uh, dumping milk, remember, if you dump milk, it's not available to make cheese and butter and all these other things. And we're pretty optimistic that the economy, the food service sector is going to be do better, I mean, doing better later on in the year. And that should help, you know, put a floor under this market for now. So we think pretty right, much real the quick, Quickly on cotton, uh, I need to say, is there any hope of turning this bearish contract around? Well, we've already bounced a little bit, Paul. It's a very economically sensitive market, but we're going to plant so few acres in the Deep South you know, poor economics and heavy, heavy rains. We think that low supply, some weather concerns, some better demand later in the season as we open the economy actually could support some better prices here. All right, something to watch there. Uh, Cattle-wise, uh, we've been watching this one closely. A Greeley, Colorado plant went offline this week. If we see another 5 to 10% cut in production, is that going to have any impact on this cattle market? Is this all about what's it doing to those plants? Or is there something else in play? It's really about the plant closure. I mean, we saw what happened with the Tyson fire late last year, Paul, and we had the crash market and then the vertical market back up. The only difference is this is not one plant. <laughs> this is multiple plants all doing it at the same time. That's the bad news. The good news is they're all going to open up again at some point later on in the season. They're all going to want to buy animals to bring through their facilities. So if one just looks at what happened to prices in the, in the fourth quarter, it looks to us like we could see a repeat here later on in the summer. Well, you have the USDA saying this week that they're going to be doing some buying, but usually that's not much more than, say, a hamburger or, you know, some of the choicer cuts. Is that just going to cause more problems in the market if they're buying, like, the, just the hamburger to disperse? Yeah, I mean, if you just, if the, if the government's just buying it in to support the market and it has no place to go with it and it's not really doing, it's not a real supply demand fundamental, it actually creates an overhang later. So, it helps now, and we're all for anything that can help the farmer get over this bridge, but it's not really something that we think is bullish for the market right now. All right, so if you're not saying much in the bullish area, so are you holding if you can on making sales in cattle, even if you, you really can make a, a sale? You really have to hold if, 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 you, if, you, if you can. For how you long? Really I think that you know, later in the summer, you're going to see much better prices. If you could make it to the summer. Uh, feeders, it's hard to resist uh, putting those feeders. I mean, you can't. You can't stop genetics and, and nature. It's already happened, but do you try to hold repopulating some of these feedlots? I think you do. You know, I mean, the, the feeder cattle market has always been the thoroughbred of the live the cattle sector. Um, it leads live cattle a lot of times, and so if we're correct about what's to take place with this kind of a V situation, you know, the and cheap remains, you know, corn prices remain as cheap as they are, you know, it could really be a rocket ship coming out of this thing. All right, rocket ship taking off when? When's the 3 two, one launch on this one? Well, if we open up the U.S. economy or start opening up in May, and that's a big if, maybe it's June, maybe it's May, but if it's May, we think most of the plants are going to start opening up by July. So we think post-July, things look really, really good for the livestock and the cattle sector. All right, let's talk quickly. Hogs, again, just as I mentioned in the lead-in, again, brutal. Is this still all production end problems, or is this a supply thing, too? Well, it has been a supply thing, as you know. Even when we had good demand, and we, even before the virus, it was a supply thing. But obviously, you know, having this plant shut down, just like cattle, you know, just just adds insult to injury. Um, but once again, we still see the same dynamics. Actually, the exports going to China were very, very good uh, so far this year. So if we can get domestic demand going again, we think the hog market will write itself to the upside here. All right. So hogs in 10 seconds. Are we holding for how long before we make a sale? 
or similar to cattle, we're holding for an idea that later summer prices are going to give you an opportunity to, to, for better prices. All right, Sean Hackett, I appreciate the time there uh, from your home office. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Paul. Thanks. All right, so Sean will come back in Market Plus when we will answer questions about citrus. That's an interesting one. We'll also talk uh, about large crop and bearish trends that are happening. We'll have that in Market Plus because that does wrap up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But as I mentioned, there's still more to talk about it. We'll cover it in that Market Plus segment, but we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it many ways, and one of them is on our website at markettomarket.org. It's also there on YouTube. We also do a podcast. And speaking of podcasts, the M2M has reached a milestone. The 200th episode drops on Tuesday. Catch a behind-the-scenes look at this program with our producers. And you can find that on our website and wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Join us again next week, though. We will continue to explore the effects of COVID-19 on rural America's bottom line. So until then, thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.